Gideon Levy, Adam Labor, Fadi Judah, Navtesh Sana, and Hadeep Singh Puri. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to be moderating a panel of such eminence and such distinguished uh, people who have uh, not only an intimate knowledge of what's happening in that part of the world between Arabs and Israelis and between the Israelis and the Palestinians in particular. I don't want to stand between you and the free-flowing conversation that we will have amongst ourselves. But in order to provide a perspective, I would, with your permission, just take a minute or two to outline how I see the state of play. To start with, I think twilight zone is an apt term to describe what is happening. We have a situation when the negotiating process, I think, suffered a severe blow after the breakout of hostilities between the Israelis and Hamas in the summer of 2014. The last successful attempt at negotiations was over 20 years ago in the Oslo Accords. For the young population on both sides, Oslo is a, only a memory, if one at all. Since then, violence levels have escalated. And more important, from my point of view, there seems to be a deep skepticism, both amongst the Israelis and the Palestinians, on the prospects of negotiations. Having had the privilege of serving on the Security Council, I am of the firm view that the core, or the essential core of the problem is the policy of settlements. The issue came before the Security Council in a resolution which was then brought by the one Arab state which was serving on the Council by Lebanon. And all 14, I would say all 15 members of the Security Council were, I think, on the same page. 14 of us supported the Security Council motion which said that all settlements post-1967 were essentially illegal. The 15th member, the United States, its permanent representative, Susan Rice, walked up to me and I, she said, we essentially agree with you, the rest of the 14, but we are not going to use the word illegal, we are going to use the word illegitimate. Uh, to my simple way of thinking, the two mean the same but they use the word illegitimate, they still cast a veto, and that resolution did not come through. The rest is history. The Palestinians went to this United Nations 
and obtained what is called non-member observer status. After that, the Palestinians have also, on the last day of uh, 2014, um, I think, applied for membership of the International Criminal Court, and they will get membership by April 2015, if I'm uh, not mistaken. How do I view the prospects for negotiated peace there? I use the word with my distinguished panelists as one of uh, considerable pessimism. But I am here to hear your views, gentlemen. Which one of you wants to start? You have the floor, Kai. Well, Hardeep, just to be a contrarian, and because I'm naturally a naive optimist, uh, you know, I, I, I think we all at this point know what should happen, what the, the compromise is. It's a two-state solution uh, along the, the green line of 1967 with a one-to-one -one exchange of land and uh, a two-state solution. But I also know that it's not likely to happen soon. Um, I, I am hopeful, being a naive optimist, that the March 17th election will shake things up and that Israelis who are in charge of and driving the dynamics of this situation will vote out this current government and bring in a government that is more open. Um, and I think the question in the March 17th election that Netanyahu himself has put on the agenda by supporting this bill calling for a, uh, identifying, defining Israel as a, a Jewish nation state is wrong. And it, Israel is not a Jewish state in my view. It is a Hebrew republic. And as such, this, if you think of it in these terms, it's a way to open up Israel as a multinational state that can incorporate Palestinian identity, and it's a way forward. And in fact, there are two Israels. Uh, I'd be interested to know what Gideon thinks of this, but there is the Israel of Tel Aviv and the Israel of Jerusalem. And the Israel of Tel Aviv is very much the Hebrew Republic, dynamic, secular, and uh, I hope that is the future of Israel. So for those reasons, I see a glimmer of hope. <laughs> and I think we all know, we, we all agree, we historians, on the narrative. Everyone claims that there are two narratives and that they are in conflict. But I believe we are actually past that. Uh, we all know that there, were, there was ethnic cleansing in 1948. There was a war, there was injustice, there are two peoples on one land. Uh, and now we need to figure out the way forward. Yeah. The, what is peace? Uh, Kai, thank you very much. And I'm glad that you've injected some uh, cautious uh, optimism into the discussion. Before I invite Gideon, I would say I just want to quote to you what Martin Indyk, the uh, chief uh, US uh, uh, negotiator, if I may describe him, uh, said, he said, annexing the West Bank and its 2.5 million Palestinian Arabs, as some Israelis on the right are calling for, is antithetical to Israel's functioning as a democratic Jewish state. If it remains democratic under this scenario, then the Palestinians will constitute a majority of the population. If it remains Jewish, then the Palestinians will be strict, stripped of their rights. This is how I would view it after what you say, but Gideon, your call. Thank you, Adip. I, you are a professional diplomat, which I'm not. <laughs> so let me be more sharp. The settlements are neither not legitimate nor not uh, legal. The, the settlements are criminal. The settlements came with one goal, to prevent any kind of settlement. And it is a huge of a success, because the settlements are the issue which prevents any kind of just settlement, 
between Israel and Palestine. And this was their original purpose. It is all about real estate. And about real estate, the settlements won, and we, few Israelis and many Palestinians, lost. But I want to get back to the basics, because the name of our session includes the word twilight. Twilight Zone is the name of my column, my weekly column, but I think that we are not dealing with Twilight Zone. I think that there are certain things which are black and white, mainly black. And everyone who thinks that the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, between Israel and Palestine, is a very complex conflict, it is not, because there are some very simple things. There is a basic fact, the basic set of facts which nobody can deny. Israel had occupied the West Bank and Gaza in 67. No state in the world, including Micronesia, had ever recognized this occupation. This occupation is now over 40 years old. It's one of the most brutal tyrannies in the world today, the occupation the backyard of Israel. This occupation must come to its end, one way or the other. The peace process that you mentioned, the longest peace process maybe in history, was never aimed to put an end to the occupation. There was not a single Israeli leader until today who really aimed to put an end to the occupation. They had all kinds of tricks to gain time, all kinds of tricks to find all kinds of ways to soften the occupation, but this basic, brutal regime of governing another people against its will for decades in order to possess more territory with all kinds of cover-ups, religious, religious cover-ups and excuses, security cover-ups and excuses, all this was always the basic of Israeli policy ever since 48. And my problem with 48 that 48 never ended. That whatever was true in 48 is true today about Israeli policy. And therefore, let's, before we get to the complexity, let's agree that there are some basic things which are unacceptable and above all, that this occupation continues. There are no excuses for this occupation. But Gideon, there are no, right? just one more sentence, there are no excuses that generation after generation, Palestinians will live in those inhuman conditions. There are no excuses that the United States will continue to support this, and the entire world will keep silent. There is no excuse to tell a Palestinian young guy from Gaza or from the West Bank. You have to wait now for another five years of uh, 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 peace okay. I process. Agree. I, 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 Very quickly. Very Gideon, quickly Gideon, intervention. Uh, yeah, I, please, if, come in quickly, and then I would like to if, say something to Yeah, please. Yeah. I agree with everything you've just said. But don't you think that if tomorrow the Israeli electorate was forced to vote up or down a referendum on a peace settlement along the 67 line, and the Palestinian population voted in the same referendum, up or down, that both peoples would say yes. Both people will say yes. The Israelis always, there was always a majority for a two-state solution, but not now, not now, and maybe not here, somewhere else. All the talkings about two-state solution, the speeches, the slogans, and the polls were always aimed to something very unclear because we don't have a partner, because there is terror, because Arafat is an obstacle, because we cannot talk to them, we cannot trust them, we cannot nothing. All the excuses are still there. And I say here, all the excuses are valid, nothing. G Gideon, thank you very much. And I don't want to use the moderator's prerogative beyond a point. But the facts of the matter are that the facts on the ground cannot change, that this is territory under occupation. I don't think there's any debate on that. But it would help as a starting point 
if further settlements, at least there could be a halt to the settlement policy to provide a window of opportunity for peace talks to resume. I'm, I'm entirely with you. I mean, but you know, it takes two to tango. The other side also have to come back to a sense of uh, what is uh, doable in a negotiating. And I know Navtej would want to come on that part a, a little later. But may I invite you, Adam, to... Uh... Thank you. Um... I think that I share some of Gideon's anger about the settlements, and I think that the settlements are clearly a major obstacle to peace. But I also agree very much with Kai that one of the strange things about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is that opinion poll after opinion poll has shown that the people themselves, the Palestinians and the Israelis, there was a majority for a peaceful two-state solution. And that it seems that the problems are coming not so much from the peoples who accept, by and large, accept the reality of each other. They may not be very happy about it. They may not be jumping for joy. But most Israelis believe that ultimately there will probably be some kind of Palestinian state. Most Palestinians realize that Israel's not going anywhere and they're going to have to live with it even though they may not like it. And there's a small minority among both of them who think really the way forward here is what Kai raised as the, um, as the what we might call the Tel Aviv solution, the, the Hebrew Republic solution, whereas Israel's and the Israelis focus much more on what it means to be an Israeli, an inclusive Israeli identity that also brings in the question of the Arab minority in Israel, which I think is one of the more fascinating aspects of this, because um, a substantial proportion of the Israeli population is not Jewish, is in fact Arab. So there's always that contradiction. And I, I remember when I was writing my book, City of Oranges, which uh, traces the story of families, Jewish and Arab families in Jaffa, I interviewed many, many uh, Israeli Palestinians or Palestinian Israelis as they define themselves, and I asked them, Many times, would you, you know, if there was a functioning viable state of Palestine, well, would you become a Palestinian citizen? And every single one from the most radical said, no, I would not, because there are certain things I have in Israel, which are the, uh, the rule of law, there are independent institutions, I'm a citizen here, and it's true that I do suffer some discrimination, but I have basic mechanisms for dealing with the government and raising my grievances. Those simply don't exist on the other side. Now, there's many reasons why they don't exist, obviously, the occupation is the prime one, but so I think in, in what, what I want to say is really that those are, those are the two important aspects, that the, both sides, the peoples themselves, are ready for peace. They're just very badly led on both sides, and also agree with Kai that the next election in Israel in March is going to be absolutely crucial, because if again the Likud wins and also even forces further to the right, like Naftali Bennett, and Habayit Hayud, uh, Hayu, Yehudi, the, the Jewish Home Party, then I think we can say goodbye to any kind of uh, likely settlement for a very long time. However, if there's a move back to the center, I think uh, centrist Israeli politicians also understand that the country is suffering from increasing isolation, increasingly unpopular around the world, and they, they want to see the country integrated, especially in the world of a globalized economy. So what we can very much hope for is that Netanyahu loses the next election and the center-left wins it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, before I invite uh, our next speaker, um, I get the feeling, sometimes sitting in New York, that the number of people who have faith in a two-state solution is actually reducing, and that uh, the uh, alternates are so much more worrying, and we could perhaps come back to that later, uh, because you cannot predicate an entire approach uh, on something which has gone on as long as this conflict has on domestic political changes, because you need to build constituencies. But we could come back to that later. Fadi, you, you, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, well, I, I think that, you know, this the way we sit up here represents a, a major um, problem for what it's like to be a Palestinian. Um, everybody is, is willing, even if you're pro-Palestinian, to speak on behalf of Palestinians. And uh, the Palestinians' permission to narrate is always limited. We are really not, we, you know, my Palestinian voice, for example, is reduced to an opinion poll where the idea of a Palestinian's um, 
right to actually express his and her deep wounds, as Gideon said, from 1948 and even before, is not considered something that is allowed to be heard for the masses because the facts on the ground, we are always told, you know, you have to do real politics. You need policy conversation. And for the public and the, and the masses, you get, uh, so much knowledge gets diluted that you're confused with illegal settlements and opinion polls, two state, one state, and in the end, and especially in India, you know, with the, with the history of the British uh, uh, colonization, in the end, what we are doing most of the time is speaking the language of power. We are not speaking the language of the vanquished, if one wants to invoke, say, Walter Benjamin, for instance. And what interests me in speaking today is not to, to, to really uh, give an opinion on anything that was said or that would be said, but to simply ask you deep inside to, to, to examine, a, as if you will, a cellular unit of what is your role as a citizen in the world toward common decency, the moral act that you hold inside you, an act of simple common decency toward the Palestinian plight. I'm not asking you to support any policies because probably none of us on this, in this space here are going to change much. Netanyahu wins, Netanyahu loses. If we were to hold this panel again next year, it'll be some other, pardon me for saying this, mumbo jumbo jargon about political language. The Palestinians have been in a crisis of liquidation for more than 60 years. And you cannot keep asking, as an act of moral common decency, to equate the vanquished with the, with the massively far superior. And keep asking the Palestinians, the Palestinians are not saints. No human is more saint than another. But you cannot diffuse and dilute the right of the vanquished and go home and sleep on it and think you, you're, you're okay with that. And before I, I move on, I would like to read a brief section from a poem by the Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish. It's called Murdered and Unknown. No forgetfulness gathers them, and it's about children, and no remembrance scatters them. They're forgotten in winter's grass on the public highway between two long stories about heroism and suffering. I am the victim, one says. No, I alone am the victim. They didn't tell the author, no victim kills another. There is in the story a victim and a killer. And I want to stop at this because one of the things that you have to grow up as a Palestinian in this bizarre imbalance of power that still spuriously blames the victim is to say, like Edward Said said, for example, that you know, the Palestinians are the victims of the victims, considering the tragic history of anti-Semitism and the Holocaust and so forth, although the Palestinians are not really to bear. But the idea of, if you want to think in your mind about a simple morality away from the jargon of political language which always serves the powerful. If, if a Palestinian kills an Israeli, then that pal let's agree that if a Palestinian kills an Israeli, that Palestinian at that moment is no longer a victim because he, perfor he performed a sin of killing. I don't want to justify it by a sin. I'm okay with that. If that's the case, and if you agree to that simple morality, then it means any Israeli, any Jewish Israeli or non-Jewish Israeli who kills a Palestinian is also no longer a victim and no longer justified. Now, if we are the masses, the masses of the, the, the citizens of the world are so confused by this jargon of politics, that we end up losing the simple morality, then Mahmoud Darwish says, look, I'm gonna give you a simple equation. No victim kills another. There isn't a story, a victim and a killer. Please do the math. And then go home and ask yourself an honest question. How far are you willing to go 
to keep blaming the victims. Stop speaking the language of power. Stop blaming the victims. Thank you very much, uh, Fadi. Before I invite Navtej, I would say that um, all of us come from different worlds, but perhaps those who are most guilty of falling into the language of power are people who come from my profession, uh, <laughs> the diplomats. And Navtej uh, has been in the same uh, uh, game, perhaps uh, not as long as I have, but he has one additional um, advantage. He has served till very recently as India's ambassador to Israel. So he um, can also bring to this discussion a perspective which I'm afraid uh, is not uh, reflected um, uh, too well on this panel. Uh, let me be very clear, uh, there is nothing that has been said by either of the three, my colleagues who've spoken, with which I could disagree. In fact, at the level of basic human decency, you cannot disagree with this kind of a discourse. Uh, you only agree with it with varying degrees of uh, vehemence. Uh, but the fact is that you need to bring violence levels down. You need to have a negotiated settlement in order to prevent the situation <coughs> from exacerbating and becoming even worse, not only for future generations of people under occupation, but for the Israeli state as well. And I think that should be the name of the game, but why don't you kick off, Navtej? You were ambassador for four years, and even in Delhi, you, I think Delhi deal as secretary, you deal with um, uh, this issue. But I'm sure you will appreciate that here he will be speaking in his personal capacity. Thank you very much, Adip. I fortunately or unfortunately, at my present capacity, I don't deal with the subject, which allows me to come onto this panel and okay, speak good. in my personal capacity. But yes, I think the, uh, the title, The Twilight Zone, is very wisely chosen for several reasons, and I think they in, therein lies some of the answers. I think it's a twilight zone essentially not between Israelis and Arabs alone, which means two, two very separate, gives the idea of two very separate bodies of people. But they are not really so separate, they are cousins. And the twilight zone between a terrible war situation like the Gaza wars and the utopian peace for which we are waiting. So essentially, we, in, in choosing this subject, we have given up either. We have given up, hopefully, the idea of permanent war, and we have given up this idea of achieving a utopian peace, at least in the, in the immediate, immediate short term. Because there are two, two levels at which you can see this problem, since you asked me to speak on the negotiating aspects. One, I think, is, is simply the diplomatic solutions, and where do we go? This panel is not going to find that solution, nor does it need to find that solution. People have made, uh, done doctorates, people have made entire careers on, on, on uh, solving this problem. Geneva and Jerusalem are full of think tanks who can, at the drop of a penny, bring you up a booklet, say, yeah, this is how Jerusalem is to be divided. This is where the trucks will be stopped. This is where the buses will go through. They have it everything down in maps, details. None of that is lacking. None of the UN resolutions are lacking, whether you call it illegitimate, criminal, or, or, or illegal. The point remains, uh, remains the same. The solutions are many. Why has it not happened at that level? Because it cannot happen, um, to my limited experience, this is a subject, if it hasn't happened at Oslo and beyond, to come to a point of Oslo and have a moment in time and history and a political space, which certainly you don't have if you step back and look at the Middle East today, you certainly don't have that negotiating space of people willing to come up and make sacrifices, to people coming to take risky decisions. You don't, you don't, have, you don't have, have a Rabin or a, or a Perez. Uh, you don't have somebody who's going to step up and say, yes, I am willing to divide Jerusalem. And until and unless you're willing to divide Jerusalem, I don't think any of the rest of it, frankly, matters. Because that ultimately is the heart of the problem. So A, it needs certain personalities, at least one personality, who's putting his life uh, on the line and saying, I am willing to do this, or two, one on both sides, so that this guy doesn't have a chance to say he doesn't have a partner. So you need those two statesmen. Until that happens, this is not a negotiation which can happen with, okay, we'll agree to this, and we, it is too deep. And I'm, I'm afraid that, uh, 
my very distinguished interlocutors seem to not go beyond 48. This is a very, very deep problem. This is as problem is as deep as the Judean Hills. And I mean, there is that famous story, which is also not very old, of the 19th century when the Jews started coming to Palestine to buy up land and they were told to say, rabbis were sent to go and see, look, go and see what the promised land looks like. And there were two rabbis who came back and went back and reported to their bosses in Vienna, the bride is beautiful, but she's married to another man. <laughs> and and this, this is the essence, essence of the problem. Who came there first? Who owns this first? Who's, and this counter-narratives, I'm afraid, cannot be dismissed as pure propaganda, both sides. I think these are narratives by which people live. They spend their day and night. It's their religion. It's their food. It's, it's what they believe in. I mean, you just have to walk in that one square kilometer of old Jerusalem to know how, how deeply entrenched this problem is. Every inch is fought over. Every inch. So if you are going to solve this problem, or I'm afraid in the short term we are condemned to the twilight zone. And, and my suggestion would be that all of us focus on how do we engage with the twilight zone. How do we engage with a certain dialogue in the twilight zone which make, makes human dignity possible? which takes, if we start naming victims, then everybody says he's a victim. Somebody's a victim of 48, somebody's a victim of 67, and somebody says we are victims because the Levant Arab countries threw us out and we are in uh, Israel because of that. So everybody has a label of victimhood. I think we have to get beyond that. But I'd be happy to come back. I don't want to hog the place. Well, thank you very much, Navtej. Um, I'm glad you focused on the twilight zone uh, my own uh, jottings as to what this meant, and I'll just share that with you before we proceed. I said it was an apt term for the current situation between Arabs and Israelis, past and present, and I'm glad you brought the past up even <laughs> further before 48. An area just beyond ordinary legal and ethical limits. An area of ambiguity between two distinct states or conditions, an indefinite boundary that constantly keeps us in suspense. And I would like, therefore, to see what, ca what it is that some of us might see doable insofar as this twilight zone is concerned in the immediate or in the medium term. At the end of the day, I think the problem will require resolution, which is uh, something on which the uh, tools and the personalities don't seem to be on the horizons. The fact that a president of the United States is ending his second term has a meaning. An incoming president uh, has a window of opportunity. Then when you come up for re-election, there are factors of um, you know, how much leverage a US president has cons uh, considering the ground realities in the United States. But what is it that can be done in the, now, you said, uh, Kai, about the um, March 17th elections. Could those be a game changer and how? Uh, I know you spelt uh, it out a little, but um, here I would like to imbibe some of your optimism and shed some of my pessimism. <laughs> okay, well, I think Gideon will probably know more about the internal politics of this election coming up than I do. but. Uh, I do believe, again, a hundred years from now, these two peoples are going to have to be living together. And they, I think a hundred years from now, they, people will look back and ask, why is it that we did nothing to make it happen sooner and thus save lives in the next war from, from, from happening? In, in, why didn't we end the violence? Because it's clear what should happen. And to be pessimistic and looking past these elections, uh, time is running out for a two-state solution. Demographic facts on the ground are being created by the Israeli right wing who are determined to annex. And I don't know, Gideon, if they annex, what, is, what are these people thinking? How are they going to 
control, occupy the Palestinians in an annexed, you know, in a greater Israel. It, it, it seems like insanity. The answer. That's a new position that I find myself as a spokesperson for the right-wingers in Israel. I'm not sure I can do it. I can what just try. Doing? I think they don't have an answer. I would rather ask you for the prescription for the medicines that you take to be so optimistic. <laughs> because whatever I try to do, I cannot reach this stage of optimism for the question about the elections. I think, look at the campaign. There's one issue which doesn't exist in this campaign. And that's the most fatal issue. And this is the continuous of the occupation. They deal with everything except of this. And therefore, don't expect any kind of change if Netanyahu will step down and Herzog will be elected, atmosphere will change, less racism, less nationalism within the country, less anti-democratic legislation, better atmosphere, better international atmosphere, the world will hug Herzog. One thing will not happen. The occupation will not come to its end. And you know, Naftesh, when you speak about Twilight Zone, and you speak about 100 years, what do we tell to the Palestinians? Wait 100 years under a twilight zone? Could you tell it to the blacks in South Africa, go for another 100 years of twilight zone? And what does it mean, this twilight zone? This twilight zone means occupation, but maybe in a more moderate way. Settlements, but maybe in a more limited way. This cannot go on. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the 21st century in which military occupations cannot last, in which no country can continue to ignore in a brutal way the international law, the international community. Show me one subject in which the international community is so united. One more subject in which China and India, Russia and the United States, Europe and even Micronesia are united. And that's recognizing the right of the Palestinian, recognizing the illegitimacy of the occupation. So to call for another twilight zone, to call for another 100 years means to tell the Palestinians you are worth nothing, your life is worth nothing, your dignity is worth nothing, you are not human beings like us or like the rest of the world. And therefore, I come back to the issue that was raised here, another sign of your optimism. You say that, you say that the two-state solution time is running out for the two-state solution. Dear Kai, I'm afraid that time ran out already for the two-state solution, and this train left the station already. Next. I wish I'm wrong, but if you think that there will be ever an Israeli leader who will be able to evacuate half a million settlers, I mean, maybe in my best dreams, I cannot think about someone like this, without evacuating the settlements, there is no viable Palestinian state. And without having a viable Palestinian state, we don't have a just solution. And without a just solution, we do, did nothing. So the two-state solution is still on the table. It's being used by many, many factors as a way to gain more time, to deepen this occupation, to build more settlements, and to speak about the two-state solution for the future to come. But the two-state solution, in my view, is a lost case because of the settlements. The settlements won, the right-wingers won, the nationalistic won, and now we have to change the discourse and start to talk about something entirely different. And this is one man, one vote. Sounds familiar to you? Yes. Does it implement for this part of the world? Yes. Because in the West Bank, because in the backyard of Israel, there is an apartheid regime, and it's time to change it. Gideon, thank you very much.
Um, I tried very hard, uh, Kai, to um, see if we can get a little tilt towards optimism. Um, I, I don't think uh, this, this discourse is heading in that direction. But we have a few minutes before we take questions. And I just wanted to ask you, the March 17th elections, plus the fact that the Palestinians now have membership of the International Criminal Court, uh, is there something that leverage which could be provided to pr you see that at least we can get a temporary halt to the uh, settlement process? The overall question, I agree with you. I don't think any uh, government elected there is going to say that occupation per se is uh, uh, not on. That's, that's not part of the narrative. But if you can get, say, a pause, a press on the pause button on the settlement process and to see if the talks can be uh, revived uh, with, with proper personalities, anyone wants to take that for a few minutes before? I, I, no, I just want to add, throw in a question more yeah. than a comment because I, I heard what Gidden said with great interest. If the two-state solution is a lost cause, uh, that's a terrible thing because that's the entire brunt of the international community has been working towards that. All your UN resolutions, etc., etc., have been working towards everything is predicated on the basis of a two state. If that is gone, then I'm sub I, I would go back into a deeper pessimism than what Gideon is, is, uh, is uh, feeling. Because then, do you ex who do we expect to give one man one vote in that situation? Yeah, I, I was going to come to that. Because if it is a question of a no holds barred uh, free for all, then one, one person, one vote. Uh, which is something that you look for in a democratic framework, and then there has to be a constituency which accepts the results. But here, where there is, uh, you know, uh, a civil war likelihood, where the rest of the area, there are sectarian fault lines which have opened up, you have problems of the ISIS or ISIL there. I mean, to me, that would just amount to pouring more um, fuel into an already raging fire. This is all true, but... Show me the scenario in which the two-state solution is still viable, is still relevant. I see all the difficulties in the one-state solution. I, but I, I, I still, please, please. But I, I believe that the two-state solution, this question should be raised to those who had demolished the two-state solution. And they did it systematically to those who brought us to this situation in which the two-state solution is no longer valid. And if you believe that the world, Naftesh, is in favor of the two-state solution. Where is the world? The United States could have brought the two-state solution within months. Within months, if the United States would just like it to happen. But the United States never wanted a solution in the Middle East, except of peace process, photo opportunities, cliches and slogans. Because Israel is depending on the United States like never before. And the moment that an American president will really want to see peace in the Middle East, or at least end of the occupation, this moment it will happen. Israel will have no other choice. And the, those big right-wingers, those patriots, those who call for, for standing against the United States, they were the first one to realize it's enough that the uh, American Air Force will declare that they stop supplying a certain screw <laughs> to the Israel Air Force, and the next day it's over. But this day doesn't come. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, um, Adam, uh, we have a minute or two, uh, and I would like to hear from you. Sure. Uh, but, you know, I mean, only one comment. One is dependent on the other, but the other is also dependent on the other one. So it, there, is, there is something that can be worked out through um, testing the extent and limits of uh, mutual dependence. But I think the one state solution that people talk about is no solution whatsoever. It can't work partly because of the reason that Fadi has outlined, because of what's in people's heads is a factor that's often very much forgotten here, is uh, the Palestinians have their very strong narrative of dispossession. The Israelis have their very strong narrative as well, that they were dispossessed. Many Israelis came from Arab countries as well and were also dispossessed. And the t those two narratives don't meet at all, apart from on the fringes and perhaps in places like this, there's very little interaction between them. So a one-state solution 
uh, would clearly have a Palestinian majority. So uh, no Israeli, very few Israelis, you know, just a tiny percentage would ever agree to that because if it was to be a democracy, Israel would be voted out of existence. If it was not to be a democracy, Israel, the whole of Israel would be a true apartheid state and would be an international pariah. So I think Israelis realize themselves that the one state solution is not going to work. The basic framework uh, and here I agree and disagree with Gideon because he says the framework for the two-state solution is dead, but he's also quite brilliantly outlined the solution in which it's completely alive, which is sufficient pressure from America saying again that, you know, we're going to stop supplying that crucial screw for your aircraft. And then there would be a psychic shift in Israel, a realization because Israel cannot survive without America. But I also think that what we haven't talked about too much is the international thing which we've touched on, uh, which is the changing international dynamic that the Palestinians rightly have proper observer status at the United Nations. They have this card which they can play uh, to declare independence and even bizarrely dissolve the Palestinian Authority, which is a kind of nuclear option, but would force Israel to take over, would force a lot of attention onto the issue. And I think it, Israelis really don't uh, want to, in that sense, run the Palestinian Authority's day-to-day -day affairs. So uh, the, the two-state solution can I think can still happen. There's been, there is movement for this on the Arab side. There was the Arab initiative, the Arab League initiative, I think a, a good decade ago, which laid out the parameters very clearly, which are, you know, shared Jerusalem, some return of refugees, uh, independent Palestine on most of the West Bank, perhaps a few territorial swaps here and there, but the basic framework is there. It is the only framework there is no one-state solution. It will never work. So we have to keep focusing on that two-state solution, and I'm bringing sufficient pressure to bear on the Israeli government that it move towards it. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, before I uh, invite um, questions um, from the uh, audience, let me just say it's very clear that um, no matter what we think of the two-state solution, that's the only um, uh, um, a framework of reference on, on, on the table. Uh, and if there is pessimism on it, we have no choice but to, again, uh, keep, keep going back to the uh, two-state solution. Equally, that this will require um, um, discipline, a rolling back of violence levels, and it will require some decisive uh, weightlifting by the United States of America um, at an appropriate time. And at that point of time, you will also require the leadership uh, on both sides, that is the Palestinians and the Israelis, to genuinely want to walk uh, that talk. But I think the Arab states, I don't think any solution is possible unless the larger uh, Arab states also contribute to the uh, peaceful solution. But that is a practitioner, uh, um, um, somebody who is, as you say, belongs to the world of uh, power language. Uh, you know, that's how it seems. But uh, the, I would throw this open now to the lady. Uh, yes, could you please um, introduce yourself and confine yourself to a question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Shivranjani. And uh, I wanted to know, it's uh, like you have already mentioned and we have seen, it's clear that international pressure isn't enough for this to work out. Um, the first world clearly gets quite hassled when people die in their own regions and not so a much. A question, please. Please confine yeah. yourself to so, a question. So um, how do you see this working out as with alternatives to international pressure, like bilateral talks or anything else, or do you see this working out at all? We'll take a few more. The gentleman here, yes. No, this gentleman, yes. Yeah. And it would be useful if you uh, direct your question, and I mean question, at one of the panelists. It will make our life simpler. <laughs> Good morning. Go on. Good morning. My question is to Mr. Gideon. Uh, I wanted to know his comments on the famous handshake on the White House lawns between the, uh, uh, Yasser Arafat and the Israeli Prime Minister. Even the Nobel Prize was accorded uh, on that handshake. Uh, if that was not an effort, what are your comments on that? Thank you. Uh, uh, we'll take one or two questions more. Uh, the gentleman here. You want a pen? Yes. Yeah, 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 no problem. 
over to Gideon. I have a question to Gideon and also to Mr. Nabdesh. Now, the, the idea of the two-state solution so far has been limited to a two-state framework. But the notion of the state and state sovereignty needs to be fundamentally rethought. It is in that context. Question, please. Yes, this is a question. You know, how do we rethink the proposal of the two-state solution in the context of the five-state involvement a Middle Eastern community? My second question is the movements of non-violent movement of resistance in Palestine which also resonates with the non-violent movement in Israel. My question to Mr. Navtej is, what is the geopolitical reason for India to have changed her position on, Israel, on, on Palestine and has been so silent on Israel brutality? The lady, yes. That's you. Yeah, please. Hello? I'd like to know from Fadi what his position is on the one-state solution, please. Thank you. There is a Palestinian in the house. Absolutely, and that's Thank why you. we want to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, hello. This is for the floor in general. We've talked a lot about how uh, we're frustrated with the political processes, which is just not getting things done. So what is possible outside the political domain for the common man to sort of act actively towards a solution? Now, I read that question uh, uh, with some alarm. But anyway, I, I think we will respond to it. Uh, yes. Oh, my god. Uh, this is a question to Fadi. Also, um, I'm so glad that you'll finally get a chance to say a little more than the others. Uh, is like we have uh, Gideon uh, in Israel, uh, which I'm very proud that in Israel we have uh, Israelis who are very pro-Palestinian. Within the Palestinian community, what is the debate within the Palestinian community? What are your issues? What are your challenges within your own community? What are your challenges in the Arab world? What sort of support or non-support are you getting? Why um, are like Palestinian refugees who are in Lebanon not allowed to own land, not allowed to work? What are those issues that you have? Well, we'll take one more question. The gentleman, uh, yeah, yes. So it's a very general question to the floor itself. Uh, so, we just talked about Israel and the backing of United States of America to Israel. Uh, so, but what did I, I didn't hear as a student of international relations was uh, how the Arab League or Iraq or Iran or Saudi Arabia have been influencing the whole situation with Iran getting involved and personally don't, they don't even recognize Israel as a country. So, what is the stand of the flow on that? So, because Israel is a nation which does not have an ally or in a 1,000 mile radius, so doesn't it have to be a bit strict or stringent with whatever it does? Well, thank you very much. I think um, we've uh, got quite a few questions which will enable us to uh, make productive use of the remaining time. Gideon, do you want to kick off? Yes. Uh, first, I would like to say I'm not a pro-Palestinian Israeli, by all means not. Pro -peace. I am even not pro-peace, I'm pro-justice. The issue is justice, not peace, and not pro-Palestinian, and not pro-Israeli. And you can be, and you should be, an Israeli patriot only if you care for the justice of your country. And anyone who doesn't care about the justice of his country is not a patriot in my view, with all the respect to the right-wingers who believe that it is justice to have a situation in which there are two peoples and one people will gain all the rights in the world and the other people will gain nothing. Those who believe that the Jewish people is the chosen people and all the rest don't deserve the same rights. About Oslo, the question here, I don't know if Oslo was a trap or an illusion, but if you look backwards, it's a very easy way to judge Oslo. I was overwhelmed by Oslo. I was really 
optimistic then, like you now. <laughs> and I really believe that we are opening a new chapter. But if, when I look backwards, I'm much more suspicious about Oslo. And there is one clear indication. Why didn't Oslo include an evacuation of one terrace in the settlements? One apartment, one building, at least as an indication for an intention to put an end to this criminal project. But there was none. And this makes me very suspicious about Oslo. Oslo, when you look backwards, made the Palestinian situation much worse. Most of the settlements were built after Oslo by peace Nobel Prize winners like Shimon Peres, who are responsible to the settlement project, at least like Netanyahu, if not more so, because they are the establishing fathers of this project. But in any case, a, any kind of agreement which did not include evacuation of settlements tells us that the intention was not genuine. It was about gaining more time to deepen the occupation. About non-violent <coughs> resistance, the Palestinians are trying very hard. And I must tell you, it's very hard to keep a non-violent resistance in front of the IDF of the Israeli Defense Forces. It's very hard because it turns into violence within minutes. I've been in so many demonstrations in which the non-violence became and turned into violence. It is a very adorable tendency in many villages which week after week they are demonstrating, including some Israelis who come to support. But this will not make the change, unfortunately. I want to say one word about the relations between Israel and India. It's not only that you can be a friend of Israel like India, or you should be a friend of Israel, but I think that today friendship, real friendship to Israel, must include objection to the occupation, must include some kind of conditions for the friendship. Which is, which is the policy? which is the policy. And there's been no change in the policy. So any suggestion that a change in government in, in, uh, in Delhi in May uh, diluted our support for the Palestinian people is, as far as I'm aware, and I can say it with authority, completely untrue. The support for the Palestinian people is total. Yeah. I'm happy I add to, to hear it. Yeah, I'm yeah. happy to Since hear the it. the question was addressed to me. Oh, well, you know, okay. I'm, I, I was in your profession also for 40 years, so there's the a, temptation, a, and if my good friend sitting there hadn't egged me on, I may have waited for you to get a chance. There's also a statement of the foreign minister Correct. on July 21, yes. on the floor of the parliament. I'll just give one example to what I call friendship. You might have a relative or a friend who is drug addict, and you care about him. There are two ways open for you. One way is to supply him with more money so he can buy more drugs. He will be so grateful to you. He will love you. Are you a real friend? Do you really care about him? The other way is to send him to a rehabilitation center. He is going to be so mad at you. He is going to resist. He is going to hate you. But this is real care. And there is no doubt, unfortunately so, that Israel is occupation addicted. And it needs some help from, 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 from the outside. I, Thank you very much, Gideon. I, uh, yes. Yeah, I, I would like to redefine optimism. And I spoke to this earlier, and I think that some of you have heard exactly what I said repeated. Optimism is to stop using the language that favors the oppressive victimizer and saying that there is no other option but the two-state solution. The Palestinians, the vanquished, the victims, on, not on the basis of history, not on the basis of narrative in 48 and 67 and 2001 or BC, AC, whatever. It is on the mere daily presence of dehumanized people. Dehumanized people who have, we can sit here and I can tell you narratives about my cousins, my nieces, my nephews, and they are not singular to me or my family. 
optimism will come in a one-state solution because it is humanity short of a genocide humanity will win inside Israeli hearts Jewish hearts Palestinians everybody and it is there is no viable option on the long term unless it is a coexistence in a one-state solution we will come back here next year ten years it will be the same conversation one is skilled in listening to the merry-go-round the repeat button on the cassette recorder when it comes to speaking about Palestinians almost always in the absent voice and I, I, I think that that you know it is it is yeah. It is what, what, what frightens me, what saddens me, what breaks my heart is that for that point to happen, we may have to get to a bleak point, yet bleaker even. Um, and I would also disagree. I would, I would honestly say that, the, the, that as a Palestinian, that a significant, overwhelming number of Palestinians inside, at least, outside and inside, you know, West Bank and, and Gaza and, and in Israel, would be more willing to accept a model of coexistence, not out of spite, and not out of we'll finish your Jewishness or all these kind of uh, paranoid uh, uh, sort of reverberations that you hear, but simply because life matters just that simply. To be able to go up in the morning and watch, get up in the morning and watch your kids go to school safely and come back safely. Which, no matter what you hear about what kind of security problem Israelis have, they enjoy that on a daily basis where most Palestinians do not. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Navtej, you will have the last word because we have to wind up after that. Uh, no, you I, don't want to annotate the government of India's no, position I, I, I beyond think, what I said? I think that has been perfectly well answered. I just wanted to refer to the fact that we, uh, we, the position is the same as that stands. I don't want to go into more details, but if you need, I can refer to you to many statements. Well, uh, having, um, it only remains for me to thank my um, very eminent uh, friends on the panel, thank you very much uh, for being yourselves, for being candid. And um, at the end of the day, I hope there was a little more optimism, at least uh, some trace which we can uh, tr try to infer. And thank you all very much for being here. With this. Thank you. Thanks.